I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker today. Um, and I think it's interesting, well, I get back to that, but I think it's interesting that the title of this series is called Social Movements, People Making History in the 21st Century. Um, because of the, the, the intellectual history of the idea of making history, and I'll get back to that as we close. But <clears throat> um, Francis, Dr. Francis Piven is a distinguished professor of political sociology, political science and sociology at the Graduate School and University Center at the City University of New York. Before that, she taught at Boston University, at Columbia University, at the NYU Law School, <coughs> the Institute of Advanced Studies in Vienna, the University of Amsterdam, and she was a Fulbright professor at <coughs> the University of Bologna. Um, a long history in both the scholarly and the ac activist realm. Um, any introduction of Frances Piven has to do justice to her contributions both as an activist and as a scholar and a professional social scientist and the list is long, um, as she's equally renowned for, in her capacities in all three of these roles. As a scholar, she's best known for her work with collaborator Richard Cloward, which produced such landmark books as Regulating the Poor, Poor People's Movements, The New Class War, The Breaking of the American Social Contract, and the duet, as Julie uh, referred to, Why Americans Don't Vote, which was published in 1988, and the updated version from 2000 of why Americans still don't vote. A central theme running through all of these works is, their is the author's dedication to uncovering the social dynamics of American political structures and social policies as they affect the lives of poor and working class citizens. In terms of scholarly honors, just to name a few, um, Dr. Piven was awarded the honorary, an honorary doctor of humane letters at Adelphi University. She's been a Guggenheim fellow, a fellow, has a fellowship from the Council of Learned Societies, a Fulbright Distinguished Lectureship. Um, she's got the, has received the Lee Founders Award from the Society for the Study of Social Problems for distinguished career-long contributions to the solution of social problems. Uh, the list goes on, I will, two of them have already been and been uh, mentioned. She was the first recipient of the 1995, in 1995 of the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Political Sociology Section of the American Sociolo Sociological Association. Um, this is a woman whose entire scholarly career has been repeatedly and deservedly acknowledged. As an activist, she was instrumental through her work with the late George Wiley in helping to bring about the liberalization of welfare policy in the 1960s. And she founded an organization called Human Serve, which was, had led a campaign to pass the Motor Voter Bill in 1993, allowing people to register to vote when they go to apply for their driver's licenses, making voting accessible to the common everyday person and not just to people who have time to go out and find a way to do it and find out how it's supposed to be done, making democracy accessible to to everyone. In the field of social movements, which is where I know her work from most, most especially, her contribution has both been both profound and widely felt. Um, rather than going through all of it, I want to give an example of how her work is not only known among scholars, but also among activists. I recently mentioned to a friend of mine my work um, deals with the autonomous movement in Germany. And I was talking to a friend of mine because I remembered her telling me over the summer in Berlin that her political action group was studying poor people's movements. And so I called her up and told her and that I was going to be introducing and meeting Dr. Piven. She says to say hello, by the way. Um, and she was very excited about this idea, this prospect, and I asked her if she could tell me from the perspective of her activist group, why they chose this book. Um, so she actually went back to her group. It's a group called No Service, which is an action group from the autonomous milieu. Um, it's only about eight people, or about 10 people, which is normal for activist groups from the autonomous movement. They tend to organize in small groups. They're mostly unemployed. Some of them have what they call black jobs, under the table jobs. 
Um, they've been meeting for the last three years on the topic of work and reproduction, the function of the welfare state, and war and anti-war struggles. And so she took my request to the group and wrote me an email back having discussed with the group why they decided to choose this book and what they wanted to tell me about that and through me to tell Dr. Piven. Um, her response was that they wanted to see to what degree it would give them usable instruments with which to analyze and understand current protest movements, like the riots in France, for example, in November of 05. What their role in such movements could be and what their political practice should look like and how to engage them in their, in their work in the campaign against dismantling the welfare state in Germany, which, which, in which they are currently uh, involved. Um, as an aside, she also reported that this book, Poor People's Movements, was the subject of a, of a special workshop at one of the autonomous summer camps this past summer. Um, so the point is that it has been, her work is not only important to scholars, but is being taken up again in this current climate with the, the threat, threats against the social welfare state in all of the Western countries. Um, as, a, as a guiding tool for how to go about challenging these systems. Um, the themes that my friend said were important to them that struck them in reading the book were, and these are also themes that struck me the first time I read it 10 years ago, um, one, that organizations are not a precondition of movements and struggles, but that organizations are an institutionalized product of movements. Resource mobilization theory emphasized up until that point that formal organization was necessary for mobilization. And uh, Piven and Cloward's book points out the ways in which formal organization can actually be a hindrance to movements organized by the poor. Secondly, that only when movements use disruptive forms of protest while violating the institutional regulations in the society were they strong enough to force the ruling class to make concessions time that this came out, I think that was a rather radical proposition. Um, for me, one of the main things that was important to me to, about this, not only this book, but another article that they wrote critiquing resource mobilization theory, was the ways in which they analyzed and, and pointed out the ways in which the resource mobilization theorists had normalized over-organized and conventionalized conceptions of collective protest in ways that end up marginalizing actual poor people's movements um, and leaving them out of our theoretical discussion in important ways. Um, all of these points were especially important in my own personal development as a scholar and as a social movements researcher. Um, I just want to sum up by saying that couple of things. One is that <clears throat> I think of Dr. Piven as the model of a scholar activist. There's the title of the, the title of this series of making history in the 21st century or whatever um, reminded me of a comment that one of my activists that I interviewed in Germany had said to me when I was asking about their strategy for social change. And his response was, now is not a time to be making history. Now is a time to be preventing history. Mm -hmm. I think if anyone can show us what it takes or guide us and give us some ideas about what it takes to make history in this kind of political climate, it will be Dr. Piven. So, thank you very much and I welcome. Yeah, why don't you fix it? <laughs>
<laughs> we'll give it a minute or two, otherwise I'll just begin. That was quite a challenging introduction. <laughs> Not working? Nope, it's not. Okay, enough. <laughs> if my voice flags and you can't hear, just wave and I'll speak up again. Now, we've been hearing all sorts of talks and reading articles which review, in a way, our litany of woes, all the things that are wrong in the United States. And, you know, the economy, from the perspective of profits and the earnings of CEOs, it's doing well. But from the perspective of a great, the great majority of working people, and you've heard this again and again, these are very grim times for 90% of households. Uh, Income is stagnant or shrinking at the same time as health care costs are rising. To keep household income stagnant or shrinking a little bit less, women go to work, but who pays for child care? So costs are going up. Heating costs are going up. Transportation costs are going up. And households are working. This is something that Julie uh, has written about to great acclaim. Households are putting in more and more hours of work. At the same time, the big unions, the fabled unions that grew up in the United States in the 1930s and 40s are on the ropes. The programs we call the safety net programs, instead of calling them the welfare state, the programs uh, that provide some in income security for very poor people or for old people or for disabled people are being chipped away. More people are poor, especially in under uh, the uh, regime of George W. Bush. And what's really kind of shocking is that the poorest of the poor are poorer still. More and more people live at half of what we call the poverty level income. The big infrastructures on which we all rely are corroding, workplace safety is jeopardized, pollution is, uh, pollution controls are in disarray, and, and this is not my subject today, but how can you not mention war? The president gave a speech two days ago promising Americans unending war on what he calls terror with untold costs for us in terms of lives lost and wealth down the drain, but also horrific costs for people elsewhere in the world. Now, why is this happening? Why are things going so sour? Politics plays a very large role in it. You, often, you know, we're given explanations about the rise of a global economy, uh, international uh, competition, international pressures on labor and so forth. But politics in the United States plays a very large role in these economic developments. Politics produces public policy. 
public policy has a lot to do with why unions are shrinking, because unions are not protected by the National Labor Relations Board or by the legislation that was crafted in the mid-1930s, and which has to be updated if it is going to be useful in protecting the right to unionize. Or public policies which roll back taxes on the very wealthy, or public policies which deregulate American corporations and which take large numbers of workers outside, of take them out from under the protections of the National Labor Relations Act, or policies which allow the real value of the minimum wage to erode, or policies which shift expenditures under existing programs from providing benefits to people, American citizens, who need whatever they need, who need health care or need other kinds of services, to providing subsidies for private corporations under the framework of public policy, at the same time as, of course, our tax monies are being shifted to military expenditures, and we've seen cuts in scores of programs constantly chipped away, uh, like Medicaid, for example, food stamp program, and so on. You can see this kind of shift. It isn't that the American social welfare state is being dismantled. We'd all notice that quickly. But rather, within the framework of that welfare state, markets are being created and corporations are being invited in to make money within the welfare state. The Medicare Part D, the drug program is a very good example of that because public money, what is that? Oh, somebody's phone. Not here, though. No, OK. Uh, Medicare Part D provides a very chaotic kind of subsidy for uh, prescription drugs for seniors. You get it until you spend a certain amount, and then you don't get any subsidy, and then it kicks in again <coughs> after you spend a few thousand dollars more. But what it also does is it gives large subsidies to pharmaceutical companies. It also prevents, by law, the government from trying to hold down prescription costs, from using its power as a big buyer of prescription drugs to hold down costs. And it also prevents the importation of drugs from lower cost producing countries like Canada. So there's good reason to be discouraged. Our politics has turned against us, and a lot of people are very despairing. We talk about a lot. We talk about the erosion of American democracy. We talk about the different changes that have contributed to that erosion, the flood of money into election campaigns, uh, the distortion, uh, distortions of the media, the launching of right-wing media centers on TV and in the press which act as hound dogs baiting the mainstream media so that they're afraid to use words like liberal, for example. The development of a Republican propaganda machine, which includes those media outlets, but also includes think tanks, for example, uh, subsidized scholars who write books, uh, uh, publish the essays in publications, and flood the newspapers with op-eds. Or the way, think about the way in which the rules of electoral politics have been twisted of late. That includes not only the classical strategies of gerrymandering, but it includes new restrictions, for example, on voting, including the requirements that are spreading across the states that people present photo IDs. If uh, if they are first-time voters, so, uh, be for the simple reason that poor people are much less likely to have photo IDs and poor people are much more likely to vote against the Republican machine. Or think even more importantly about the way in which lies and propaganda, including propaganda that now includes the creation of terrifying events, 
have been used to override public opinion. Because, because the Amer American public opinion on these sorts of issues has not changed hardly at all in the last 30 years. Americans still believe that government is responsible for ensuring the economic well-being of ordinary people. Uh, Americans still think that poor people should get help. Americans think that the aged should be taken care of, that the sick should be healed, and that government is responsible for all of that. Uh, but nobody is thinking. Nobody thinks about that when the emphasis of our leaders is on terror alerts, uh, strange, unknown threats that are posed to the United States from places and people that nobody can assess on the basis of their own experience. Well, so people get discouraged. They even talk about an American fascism that is overtaking the United States. But I think we ought to be careful when we make such sweeping statements. We ought to be careful that we don't misread what was much of American history. Was it so great before? Or when was it so great before? When was it different? Was it really true? Uh, as I think there's a tendency to think in American political history textbooks that 19th century America was some kind of democratic golden age, a kind of pageant of democracy with everybody churning out for elections, having a rollicking good time, picnics and parades, friendly, boozy, pot-bellied bosses running our cities. It wasn't really like that. That's our folklore. Those are the stories we tell each other, and unfortunately, some of us tell our students. Because in the late 19th century, when uh, m machine politics uh, was so sturdy, was also the era when the, rail, the big railroads bought the state legislatures, and the state legislatures in turn picked the Senate, and the Senate picks the, picked the Supreme Court. And big American corporations did what they wanted with government. In fact, the gist of my argument today is that democracy, American democracy, understood in terms of uh, electoral representative arrangements, doesn't really work very well in the absence of the kinds of disruptive threats that are sometimes posed by social movements. Now, it is true, I also believe, that electoral representative institutions are a remarkable invention. The invention doesn't work very well, but think for a moment how extraordinary an invention this was and is. I mean, how it embodies the aspirations of ordinary people to be able to control their own destinies. Look what it does. It constructs an equal resource, the vote. Everything about social life is unequal. Some people have all the money, all the prestige, all the cultural influence. But electoral representative institutions say, put that aside, everybody, or almost everybody, not everybody, not those people who are turned away for lack of photo IDs, but almost everybody has the right to vote. And this right to vote will presumably override all other inequalities. That right to vote, moreover, is exercised at periodic elections, and state rulers State elites are dependent on winning a majority of those votes in order to stay in power. So rulers are beholden on this equal, on, on mass publics 
who have been equalized by the right to vote. Those arrangements, together with associated rights, like the right to speak freely, the right to associate or organize, those arrange arrangements are an invention, an institutional invention, which I think is remarkable. And it's no wonder that that invention, of course it didn't happen all at once, it was a cumulative invention, that has inspired some of the most poignant struggles in modern history. Because that invention, the idea that we are all equal and we can control our rulers, that invention captures the imagination. It is, I think, the most compelling idea of modern politics. And even today, it inspires people. Think of the struggles in Haiti, how people over the last decade or so, people have actually braved death to exercise the right to vote or the struggles that went on in the Philippines and are still going on in Nepal. Because this set of institutional arrangements holds out the promise that the formidable powers of the modern state can be directed by ordinary people. An amazing idea. Now, of course, as I said, it doesn't work very well. And it doesn't work very well because votes are not in the real world the only currency that operates in this set of institutions. Hypothetically, electoral representative institutions are constructed and insulated from all of those inequalities that exist in the real social world. But that's only hypothetically. In actuality, electoral representative institutions are penetrated and swamped, and the rules themselves are begged by other resources that are very unequal, including money including control of the media and control of other cultural institutions, including the military. That's what happens in American politics and has happened in American politics for a couple of hundred years most of the time. This is normal American politics. Still, it couldn't be the whole story because we have another kind of history too. There is a history of egalitarian reform in the United States, a history that begins perhaps with the American Revolution that continues, I think, gloriously in the abolitionist movement and through the Civil War, and that also wells up again in the 20th century in the social movements and reforms of the New Deal and the Great Society. In all of those periods, in each of those periods, I think it was defiant collective action. And the great drama of co defiant collective action, the communicative power that resulted from that action, and the disorder, the institutional breakdowns that defiant collective action threatens, whether it's the mass strike or the riotous crowd or the street blockade, and also the electoral reverberations of those actions that fueled these singular periods of egalitarian reform in American history. Think about it for a minute. The mobs of the American Revolution were inspired by the ideals of radical democracy. They really believed that not only that ordinary people should have the vote, but that they should monitor their representatives, that their representatives should be close to them, that they should have access to everything they said and did in the legislature, that the legislature should be the main authority, 
and that the representatives should come up for election every year. Uh, the, this, they were inspired by this sort of vision of how a people could control their own destiny. And they didn't win. They did succeed in shaping some state constitutions in the period of, 19, of 1776 and the early part of the revolution. But those constitutions were quickly rewritten. And moreover, the movement for radical democracy was, in a sense, finessed by the post-revolutionary effort of American elites to create a distant government that would have powers to override in crucial areas what state legislatures did. Uh, the founding fathers I'm talking about and the writing of the American Constitution. But these, the mobs, armed mobs, by the way, they were the ones who fought the revolution, the mobs of the revolution, in the end, they won some concessions from the founding fathers. They won the People's House, the Congress, the lower house of the United States. There's a reason that those people have to return to stand for election every two years. They did win a Bill of Rights. They won the building blocks of American electoral representative institutions, which are flawed, but they did come into existence. Or think about the abolitionist movement that emerged some, uh, about half a century later. Well, often when the abolitionists are described, we think of them as orators, and they were orators. A lot of them were preachers. They did a lot of talking. Uh, they were wordsmiths. They talked, they had meetings, they uh, had uh, started publications. But their words were incredible, uncompromising, fanatical, we would call them today. Uh, and they infuriated the South, where slavery was, of course, critical. The, uh, the Garrisonian idea that the movement could only have one goal, that it couldn't muddy its agenda with what we call today a multi-issue uh, uh, program, that it had one goal which was emancipation immediately. Now, the, the wordsmiths, the orators, who sometimes provoked lynch mobs, they operated largely in the churches. The United States was always a very religious nation. And their effect was so incendiary that they broke apart the major intersectional churches in the country, Southern Baptists, Northern Baptists, Southern Met Methodists, Northern Methodists. They broke apart the Presbyterians, too. And this, uh, we are, some people say we're a kind of ethnocultural political nation, this, these churches helped to keep together a nation that was in fact composed of sections with different kinds of economies and different kinds of culture. And later, the abolitionists also helped to staff the Underground Railroad, which bled slaves from the South and, of course, escalated the fury, the anger, and the fear of the South. So this movement was very disruptive, even though it was a movement in a sense of words. But the movement also had an electoral impact. That's what movements do. Movements communicate. And they communicate in ways which are dramatic enough to penetrate the fog of regular political machine 
propaganda. And they not only communicated, they disrupted the major parties. That's another thing that movements do. They fragment majority coalitions. The abolitionists fragmented the Whigs and the Democrats, leading to the rise of the Republican Party, uh, the candidacy of Abraham Lincoln, who, when he was elected, let, uh, precipitated the secession of the South. Now, all this disruptive, right? Cleaving, fractionalizing. And that's exactly why emancipation was won. With the South seceded, uh, Lincoln led the country into a war. The war created actually the necessity for immediate, for immediate emancipation, at least in the seceding states. Otherwise, this was not Lincoln's agenda. They needed, he needed it because he needed freedmen to uh, serve in the Union Army and in the Union apparatus. And after the war, with the South, in a sense, temporarily disenfranchised, the country passed, the, the Congress and the state legislatures, but the South no longer had a vote, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and the brilliant Civil Rights Act of 1865, which anticipated virtually all of the achievements of the civil rights movement that came a century later. Of course, once the war was over, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were won, the abolitionists faded into the Republican Party, politics returned to its default position, where money, manipulation, and incumbency dominates the outcome of elections and corporate power in the United States at the end of the 19th century grew. Or think about the brilliant moments of 20th century reform. Sometimes the New Deal is depicted as a kind of smooth translation of, well, public demands produced by the economic hardship of the Depression led to new political leaders who produced new policies reflecting public demands. But it really didn't happen quite like that. It's true, of course, that FDR was elected. And it's true, of course, that FDR did become a reformer. But although in his 1932 campaign he did voice anti-business rhetoric, his platform was the same as the Democratic platform had been in 1924 and 1928. He had been a relatively timid reformer as governor of New York. It was mounting protests by the unemployed in the early 1930s, mounting protests as the unemployed deluged relief offices, as mobs of people gathered to return the people who were being evicted to their homes, as farmers gathered to threaten to string up sheriffs who were foreclosing on farms. It was these protests that produced first the big emergency relief legislation of 1933 and a program of subsidies for farmers. And later, in, after the modest revival of industry in 1934, uh, helped to produce the general strikes in Toledo, Minneapolis, and San Francisco the Democrats were sufficiently threatened and sufficiently unsure of their base to introduce the Wagner Act the, and the Social Security Act. After the great sit-down strikes in Flint, where masses of automobile workers occupied the factories 
surrounded by National Guardsmen, the Supreme Court declared that the National Labor Relations Act was the law of the land. And the first National Labor Relations Board was established, and it was a pro-labor board, clearly a pro-labor board. And it was supposed to be a pro-labor board. Again, of course, once the protests subsided, once American business regained its self-confidence and its, you know, its footing in public esteem, which it had lost in the 1930s. That's why we got that legislation. Business was cowed. Uh, the gains of the National Labor Relations Act were gradually whittled away, partly by legislation. Smith Connolly tapped Hartley. And also by the character of National Labor Relations Board appointments. And by the 1980s, Business and its representatives in government were targeting the Social Security Act as well. Or think about the 1960s and 1970s. Again, it was a period when there were many important reforms, including women's, new women's rights, feminist rights, environmental gains, workplace safety and workplace safety enforcement for a change, and the tamping down of the war in Southeast Asia. An incredible array of victories. Uh, and I didn't even mention civil rights, wh in, through which the victories of the abolitionists were in a way reclaimed. Now, these gains reflected powerful social protest movements, including the feminist movement, environmental movement, the resurgence of worker militants in the 1960s and early 1970s, and a ferocious anti-war movement, particularly the GI anti-war movement. Now, there are reason, these movements cluster, and there are reasons that they cluster. Uh, some movement analysts have referred to this phenomenon as cycles of protest. Sometimes the movements are demeaned by being uh, said to imitate each other. And there is some imitation that goes on. You can even find protest movements of women in China where the women take on, in a sense, the apparatus of the mothers of the disappeared in Chile. Uh, there is some of that, and what's wrong with that? But much more important in accounting for the clustering of the movements is, I think, that the pioneering movement reveals the vulnerability of the regime, and especially its electoral vulnerability. Well, the pioneering movement of the 1960s and 70s was the black freedom movement. You know, if in the background of the 1930s movements, insurgencies, there were, the background was importantly shaped, of course, by the Depression and by hard times, the ba background of the black freedom movement was, was also in an economic transformation. The economic transformation of the South, which reflected agricultural mechanization and also large-scale subsidies to big landowners for not using their land. And these two uh, programs, mechanization, by the way, some of which was paid for by the federal government, and uh, subsidies for not growing crops led to the massive ejection of the black rural labor force from the plantations of the South. Now, that ejection produced new political resources. It's true that it produced terrible hardship, too. People were forced off the land. They were forced out of those little shanties that they lived in. They were no longer allowed to be sharecroppers. But it, the, the, those hardships were, you can't say balanced, you can, but you can say they were accompanied by a kind of liberation liberation from the total institution 
which was the plantation. It had exercised total control over the people who worked the plantation. At the same time, the forced migration of people to the cities produced some con urban concentration, first in the southern cities and then in the northern cities. And there is a kind of political resource in concentration. People feel somewhat protected by that kind of concentration. One of the distinctive features of slavery in the United States, as contrasted with the Caribbean or Brazil, was that our slave holdings were so dispersed, 20 slaves on average in a holding, as opposed to the huge plantations, which permitted people to live together with some solidarity in villages. So migration produced to the cities produced some concentration, sense of protection. It also meant that many of people who had worked in agriculture as a kind of serfs, really, now entered the wage economy. And that also was generated some political resources because people who earned wages could pay their own pastors as opposed to the pastors in the old slave system who depended entirely on the big landowners. Uh, the results were first evident in the protests in the southern cities at the early part of the civil rights movement in Montgomery, Albany, Birmingham, Selma. Incredible uprisings in which people who had lived in the belly of the southern slave system, surf system, rose up defying southern law, braving southern sheriffs and police and southern mobs with marches, demonstrations, and also shutting down business districts. Montgomery was not just a march. It also meant that downtown businesses in Montgomery or downtown businesses in Birmingham were suffering very much like the blockades that are spread, spreading across Latin America, uh, and also, of course, filling the jails. This had a huge electoral impact, a divisive impact. We don't like divisiveness, but I'm saying that a divisive electoral impact is part of the dynamic that these movements set in motion. The Southern Civil Rights Movement began the process of driving the white South out of the Democratic Party. At the same time, as it galvanized growing numbers of blacks who were now in the urban North and who had gained the vote. In other words, the movement cleaved the party's base, the Democratic Party's base. White Southerners had already been drifting away from the party and the, the movement, by raising these issues so dramatically, so sharply, also put black, vote, black votes in doubt for the Democratic Party for the first time. The ultimate result was that the Democratic Party had little choice but to champion the major civil rights measures of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And it could not prevent the loss of the South. Now, of course, the loss of the South weakened the party. It drove the hitherto one-party South into Republican columns. But it was also the fissure that made possible the main reforms of the 1960s, including not only the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, but and, but it also fi it finally brought the new birth of freedom agenda of the post-abolitionist period to realization. Moreover, the inevitable spread of the movement to northern cities, the northern cities to which blacks were migrating in huge numbers, meant the escalation of protest from marches to riots and from civil rights to economic rights. You know the result. It had a huge impact on American politics. The Democrats lost the South. Their base became the northern cities. 
They responded with the first expansion of the American welfare state since the 1930s, Medicaid and Medicare, new housing programs, food, stamps pro food stamp programs, WIC, the Women's Infants and Children's Feeding Program, the expansion of welfare, and so on. But somebody's going to say, if you have a question period, the protest subsided. And then what happened? Well, maybe the protest subside is inevitable. There's a kind of internal exhaustion. There are also the processes of co-optation and repression that the movement sets in motion. And there are also the victories of the movement, which in a way rob it of legitimacy. Everybody says, don't you people have enough? Didn't you win enough? What more do you want? And once the movement subsides, so once the movement subsided in the 1970s, the American right regrouped with business in the lead to roll back and refashion the reforms of the 1960s and early 1970s. By 1980, Ronald Reagan was in the White House, 1981. Uh, he had achieved in that election campaign the uniform support of American business. All the money went to Reagan. And we witnessed a period in which both the New Deal and the Great Society was being hammered and rolled back a period that was hard, not really interrupted by Clinton. Well, George W. Bush has renewed the drive to reverse the reforms of the 20th century or to refashion them by turning public dollars over to private mar market actors. Even the war on terror, the war on Iraq, can be understood as a strategy to make possible to facilitate these rollbacks. It's all made possible by the right-wing domination of all branches of government, by an opposition that is intimidated and silenced by war talk, terror talk. And it's also made possible by the domestic plunder, which has benefited many interest groups. So what now? There's another election in November 2006. The Democrats may retake, they'll probably retake the House. There'll be a bigger election in 2008. But the Democrats don't seem, the Democratic Party doesn't seem very inspiring. It doesn't seem very bold. It's hard to know what its program is. It's sort of cautiously waiting for the Republican Party to implode. Uh, the reasons for this are pretty clear. Democrats need money, too. For 25 years, the Democratic Leadership Council has been corroding the sort of populist core of that party and its programmatic commitments that emerged in the 19. 30s. Still, we do want to elect Democrats, because Democrats give people more courage. But my reading of American history argues that the electoral opposition, the Democratic Party, will only come alive when protest movements emerge which threaten that party with the polarization that characterized the great movements of moments of reform in American history. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Contradictions? Yes. 
makes me optimistic. Well, first, and there's some people in the audience who could also speak to this, it seems to me that when movements are emerging, and even when they reach their peak, commentators often say, where's the movement? This isn't a real movement. It wasn't like this in the old days. Then we had a big movement. It was solidarity. It sang songs and had this and that. So it's very, it's, it's very hard to assess the emergence of a movement when you're sort of within the currents that are giving rise to the movement. The early years of the civil rights movement was very, very stop and go. Uh, there would be some protests. The Montgomery boycott occurred in 57, and then not much happened. And then there were the Freedom Rides in 59 and 60, and then not much happened. And then uh, nobody noticed Albany, Georgia, which by some readings was a kind of turning point in the movement because it showed that large numbers of ordinary African Americans were willing to go to jail for this movement. Uh, so. So my first comment has to do with reading the movement what, from a contemporary uh, point of view. My second is I think that we have a lot of opposition, that the culture, there's a lot of oppositional culture in uh, music, song lyrics, in film. Uh, I don't know how much and this is something I really don't know, and maybe, Bill, you want to comment on this, how this translates into political action. I don't know. I've always wondered about it. I mean, does a political film like Missing, which showed the role of the American government, especially the CIA, uh, in Chile, does that lead people to join the anti-intervention movement in Central America? I don't think so. But what contribution does it make? And Bill, do you want to comment on that? I just want to say what one of the things that affected me in the last year was the immigration demonstration last spring, which to me had a different quality about it than a lot of other things that were going on. But I was kind of an energy Although, you know, just a day or two ago, the New York Times had a big story in which it said that the immigration movement is flagging. Uh, don't be sure. I don't read the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> yes? I'm, I'm curious to hear a little more about the, what, the point that you left us with, with which is that if there's enough disruptive protest to, aimed at the Democrats that actually splits the Democratic Party, that that will somehow translate into the, the Democrats that are left in power somehow being able to push through reforms. And my question is, in the 60s, when that happened, it <coughs> seems like even after losing the South, the Democratic Party had enough power to be able to push through but it seems like now, with the Republicans controlling all three branches of government, splitting the Democratic Party is going to lead to... You threaten I mean, that's splits. That's what led to the, the you Republicans can't. having all three branches of government, arguably, yeah. because of Nader's campaign. Well, it's, um, the, it's the threat of the split that uh, produces the threat of cleavage in, you know, in, we have a, a two-party system in the United States. 
which means that to win major office, a politician has to win a majority. This is uh, a sort of unlikely feat in a way in a country so riddled with differences, with divisions. Uh, and in order to do it, politicians avoid issues. I mean, they plaster together coalitions that are pretty unlikely. Uh, and those coalitions are susceptible to uh, divisive influences when new issues are raised, issues that politicians try to avoid. It doesn't mean that the division is actually realized in terms of an explosion of the party. Uh, it may or may not be. Yeah, and it's worth thinking through what would the divisions be. I don't think that uh, I don't see a major cleavage like the cleavage between the northern and southern wings of the Democratic Party emerging. But if you don't have that kind of electoral politics, the kind of electoral politics that's set in motion by movements, then you have the endless uh, efforts to win people who are presumably in the middle. Uh, so that the Democratic Party leans toward Perot voters. Uh, and the Republican Party does the same. Look at the spectacle, for example, of the Republican National Committee giving all that money to Lincoln Chafee in Rhode Island. Uh, that's because they're fighting for that, they're contending for those mar uh, swing voters in the middle. Produces a very sort of contentless politics. Yes. Well, I think it's unlikely uh, that we would, ha we, we would develop a stable three-party system. I think that the rules of our electoral game uh, make that extremely unlikely. It's never happened in the past. Uh, and accepting with, with the emergence of the Republican Party in the 1850s, and that was uh, the Republican Party filled the vacuum that had been left by the disintegration of the Whigs. So it was, again, a two-party system. That said, I think that third parties sometimes uh, serve a very good political purpose in American politics because, in a way, they're a little like movements. They raise the issues that the, both major parties want to avoid and they threaten to peel off voters, some voters, with those appeals. That's what Nader was accused of doing in the 2000 election, peeling off enough voters with his more left liberal appeals so as to give the presidency to George W. Bush. Now, the dynamic could well have been that the Democrats would respond to that by moving to the left, which is what is uh, uh, what happened in the interplay between third parties and the major parties in the late 19th century, when we had a lot of these upstart uh, third parties who lived for you know flared up, forced the major parties to the left in this case. Uh, it doesn't have to be to the left, it could be to the right. Uh, with, with the consequence of juicing up American electoral politics, because otherwise it's completely pallid. The public is fed non-issues that have to do with the flag and sunrises and things like that, while the government goes to war. Yes. 
By the cultural differences, do you mean what other people call the social issues? I think it's always been there. I don't think that we have greater cultural differences now than we have had at earlier periods. Uh, I mean, the cultural differences between, they can't, those cultural differences can be destructive, it's true. It's probably the case that in the election of 1896, the cultural differences between the uh, largely European urban working class and the farm-based Protestant populist movement uh, prevented an alliance between urban workers and populist farmers that the People's Party was trying to build. It's probably, it probably was an important uh, condition. But you try. Who can be sure? Sometimes, it, you know, it, it, those cultural di differences are overridden all the time by the major parties. I mean, it's true they do it by talking about nonsense, but, but they do override them all the time. Julie. Well, I, I think there's something to the idea that when people are working one and a half jobs, uh, they don't have time uh, to do politics. And uh, I mean, one of the things that welfare reform did, it put all those women into workfare programs, and then they have the kids, and they didn't have any time. Uh, or uh, one of the things, the feminist movement helped to move women into the workplace and lost its own constituent, I mean, lost its foot soldiers and its leadership because everybody was working. Uh, so there's certainly something to that, but it's also the case that, you know, movements are very, are constantly changing. They change in form. And w one of the things we still have to see is how much the internet changes the forms of movement action. It was uh, interesting that MoveOn in the last few years did try to connect on the ground, face-to-face -face meeting type movements uh, with the connections, the relationships they were building on the internet. I don't have a report on how that worked, but, you know, even though people are working harder, they're also volunteering more. So that's a kind of contradiction. And then there are all the people in the universities. Now, people in universities have time. I know, I've been there. <laughs> and the, do you remember how in the old days everybody used to say, want to be a member of the working class and go to work in an automobile factory or a steel plant so that they could be a radical? Well, 
the universities are much bigger than the manufacturing sector now. Uh, they play a very large role in the society. And there's a lot of fluidity there. There's a lot of latitude. I don't think that it's true that everybody is so tied up so that there are no constituencies for movements. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's true that everybody plays these language games in which some words become tarnished and you don't use them anymore. You try not to use them. Uh, so you call uh, Dan Rather a liberal and you contribute to breaking his career. But so everybody then calls themselves progressive. Uh, I always thought that was more left than liberal. But I guess I was wrong, because <laughs> the so everybody goes around renaming, naming, tarnishing, renaming. Uh, it's a process. I don't think you have to do anything about it at all. As for the the other point that you're making, which is that we're not going to get good press, uh, and we're not going to get time on the major networks. Uh, you know, it's always been like that. That's just the way it is. When, in the 1930s, when FDR ran, I think there were only a couple of newspapers in the country that supported him. It just, you, but doesn't mean that he was defeated. He wasn't. So, and you know, I mentioned this when I began talking, but public opinion has, in a way, been remarkably sturdy when it comes to issues that people have some experience of. It's true that they can get all excited about WMDs and Saddam Hussein because they don't know. They don't do weapons inspections, and their leaders tell them that there are WMDs there. But when it comes to Social Security, well, they do have some experience. And you really can't, they did not succeed in shaking people's confidence in Social Security. Although that's exactly what they tried to do. They didn't say Social Security is bad. It's not good for you to have security when you're old because <laughs> then you won't work as hard as long. They didn't say that. They said instead that, oh, the program won't be there for you. And that it was a very hairy kind of period. And I'm not, I think that probably did do damage to the program, lasting damage to the program, but not enough damage. So, you know, you can't be an insurgent and expect to get support from the top, that's 
just the way it is. You have to move against the current. Which political sect uses that phrase? I can't remember. 